I found Alan Turing's original paper in 1936 that he wrote on this problem of, uh, of computation, on the idea of a computing machine and what it should be. And uh, it's not an easy paper to read, but I left a copy of it on your, uh, on your table there. And he was 24 years old. He was born in 1912. So he was 24 years old when he wrote that famous paper. I also printed out another paper, which in some ways is even more famous, at least with non-technical people. It's a paper he wrote that appeared in Mind magazine. And I'm not really sure what that is, but my guess is that it's something like a, like a scientific American style. It's, it's a journal of philosophy? It's a real journal? Yeah. Not a popular thing? OK. So, so it's a philosophy uh, um, journal. And he wrote a paper that's very readable and that's been reprinted in a lot of places. And I have it up front. You can look at it. It's got nothing to do with Turing machines or undecidability. It has to do with the Turing test and the beginnings of artificial intelligence. Basically, his thesis that there's no reason why a computer can't do what, what humans can do. And here's why I think that. And people have written uh, rebuttals and comments to this for the whole last 50 years. And um, I have a lot of literature on all that stuff. It doesn't really connect much to this course, but it is kind of fascinating to read that article. So I left that up there for you, too. But what I have here that I want to read to you is some excerpts of his paper that are actually comprehensible, to give you a little sense of what he was thinking when he was 24 years old about, about these ideas. Um, so here it is. This is Alan Turing, uh, his paper on computable numbers. He says, computing is normally done by writing certain symbols on paper. We may suppose this paper is divided into squares, like a child's arithmetic book. In elementary arithmetic, the two-dimensional character of the paper is sometimes used. But such a use is always avoidable. And I think that it will be agreed that the two-dimensional character of paper is no essential of computation. I assume, then, that the computation is carried out on a one-dimensional paper, that is, a tape divided into squares. And I'll also suppose that any number of symbols which may be printed is finite. So he's using some finite alphabet. So he's describing this, this formality that we all know today very well. If we were to allow an infinity of symbols, then there would be symbols differing to an arbitrary small extent. The effect of this restriction of the number of symbols is not very serious. It's always possible to use sequences of symbols in the place of single symbols, etc. So he says how to encode things with a few number of symbols. And the next thing is kind of interesting, the next uh, paragraph, because it's very easy to read wrong nowadays, now that we have the word computer in our vocabulary. He says, the behavior of the computer at any moment is determined by the symbols which he is observing and his state of mind at that moment. So what do you think that means? The behavior of the computer at any moment is determined by the symbols which he is observing and his state of mind at that moment. That's like the fundamental idea of a Turing machine. He's saying that the transition depends on what state you're in and what symbol you're looking on at the tape. But read the grammar. Isn't it strange? I mean, he's, it seems like he's just anthropomorphic whatever that word is, the verb, the, the computer, right? He refers to it as a he and his state of mind at that moment. So how do you think you read that line? He's talking about the person computer. Right, he's talking about one who computes. The word was not commonly used at the time. So he's using it, he's making it up. He says one who computes is a computer, a person who computes, not a machine that computes. And he's talking about the computer as someone who computes. And, and, and he uses this for the next three or four paragraphs. So it's very interesting and easy to read wrong today. We may suppose that there is a bound B to the number of symbols or squares which the computer can observe at one moment. If he wishes to observe more, he must use successive observations. Move along on the tape where he left the other stuff. We'll also suppose that the number of states of mind which need to be taken into account is finite. Right? So whatever methods this person is using to do his computation, it's a finite state machine, really, that's doing it. The reasons for this are of the same character as those which we restrict the number of symbols. If we admitted an infinity of states of mind, some of them will be arbitrarily close and will be confused. All right. Uh, let us imagine the operations performed by the computer to be split up into simple operations which are so elementary that it is not easy to imagine them further divided. So he's trying to take all sorts of computation and divide them into their teeniest, most atomic stages. Every such operation consists of some change of the physical system consisting of the computer and his tape. We know the state of the system if we know the sequence of symbols on the tape, which of these are observed by the computer, and the state of mind of the computer. 
So there he's describing what we call a configuration of the machine. Right? Any other changes can be split up into simple changes of this kind. The situation in regard to the squares whose symbols may be altered in this way is the same as in regard to the observed squares. So without any loss of generality, assume that the squares whose symbols are changed are always the ones that we're observing. Because we can always move over and look at the ones we want to change if they're not right in front of us right now. Okay, and then he says a few more things, and he talks about the tape, and he says, the simple operations must therefore include changes of the symbol on one of the observed squares. B, changes of one of the squares observed to another square within L squares of one of the previously observed squares. A possible change of symbol together with a possible change of state of mind. A possible change of observed squares together with a possible change of state of mind. Now, the most interesting part of this paper, and we're going to talk about it a little bit today, is that what he does after he describes the notion of computation and how it should be done, he describes that he can actually build a particular program that simulates other programs. So he's going to write a Turing machine that takes other Turing machines as its input and then executes them, simulates them, runs them. That's just like what your computers do. You write a program and it does your program. So the machine becomes your virtual machine. If you're in Scheme, the machine is understanding Scheme, even though it could understand anything else because you told it how to understand Scheme. So underlying all these programs that you run is a universal program that can do anything. And that's the computer. And that's what he's describing. He says he can make a Turing machine that reads other Turing machines in his input and simulates them. And that's what we call today the universal Turing machine. He says, now we may construct a machine to do the work of this computer. And he goes in a lot of detail describing the universal Turing machine. And then, uh, and then he gives up. And it's pretty much the main beginning and the main idea of the motivation of his paper. Uh, I'll leave this out there, too, because it's worth reading. I skipped a lot of it, but a lot of it's fun. And I want to get back to talking about his model. We show that having extra tapes isn't really extra power, and having non-determinism isn't really extra power, and having two-way infinity isn't extra power. There are a lot of questions that people have asked me in the last day or two that relate to these variations, and I just want to say a few more. What if you allow uh, a restricted number of tape symbols? Let's say 0, 1, and blank. Well, you can prove, there's a theorem that says, if you give me any Turing machine that uses any number of tape symbols that it wants, I can write another Turing machine that does the same thing and uses only zeros, ones, and blanks. So without any loss of generality, you can assume your machine only has these, these three symbols. However, there's usually a payoff for making these transformations. So what do you think gets bigger in the machine if you knock the symbols down from a large alphabet to a small alphabet? There's probably more states in the machine. Right? So you can't have everything. You can't say, OK, I want this machine to only have three symbols and say no more than uh, 10 states. OK, why not? Well, why? Why is that too many limitations? What if I, what if I restrict the number of tape symbols? I restrict the number of states? If I only have 10 states on the board, I make 10 circles, and I only have two symbols, you could list every single Turing machine there is. Just try every possible transition that comes out of one state to another state and put the different combinations of symbols on them and different writing symbols. You could just list all the Turing machines in the world. There'd be a finite number. That's a completely uninteresting model of computation. Even finite state machines, there's an infinite number of finite state machines. We don't say, let's restrict the finite state machines to a 10 finite states. At that point, there would just be a finite number of computations you could do. So you can't restrict both things at the same time. There's a trade-off. If you do, you completely cut off the power of the machine. You've got to be able to expand one thing unbounded amount. And we typically imagine that the finite state can get as big as you want, but stay finite. Sure. Yeah, there's a lot of grad students, right, in the 60s and 